Society burglar strikes again. Mm, series of burglaries. Six over the period from June 2nd to June 17th. On July 2nd, the 7th occurred at the home of Sir Sanford Leeds. Cleopatra Tiara stolen, it says. As in the other cases, uh, no sign of extensive search by the thief and only one piece of jewelry involved. Victims elsewhere at the time. Here's a complete list of the particulars, Holmes, if you'd care to read it. I believe you'll find them in the study. How do you do, gentlemen? I am Gerald Locke. Please be seated, Mr. Locke. How can we be of service? Three days ago, Guy Clarendon was found murdered at Halliday's. It's preposterous, but Miss Frances Nolan has been charged and is being detained at the criminal court, Old Bailey. Frances Nolan? Ah, yes. Sister of Loretta Nolan. Only surviving heirs of Sir Malcolm Nolan, founder of the Aberdeen Navigation Company. I seem to recall that Sir Malcolm and Lady Nolan were killed when some lunatic threw a bomb into their carriage. It seems to me that later I heard something about it being a case of mistaken identity. Wasn't one of their little offspring in the carriage with them at the time? Yes, it was Loretta, Francis's sister. She was only four. Miraculously, she was uninjured. Mr. Locke, I've heard that you are a suitor for Miss Francis Nolan's hand, are you not? Yes. And was it not also true that she was being courted by Guy Clarendon? Unfortunately, yes. Have you any idea why Frances Nolan was charged with the crime? Ah, well, she was discovered over the body with a pistol in her hand. That would do it. But you don't understand. Frances is totally incapable of murder, not even of a scoundrel such as Guy Clarendon. Scoundrel? But he's from such blue blood. Also, if I'm not mistaken, he's an accomplished batsman for the West London Cricketeers. A ranked fencer in international competition. He was also a bit of a bounder, Watson. What an understatement. Guy Clarendon was excessively fond of cards and strong drink. His father had all but disinherited him. I tried to tell Francis that Clarendon was no good, but to no avail. And now look at the mess she's in. Will you help? Most certainly. <laughs>
I question why we have come to this location. If clues are what we are seeking, then we are in the wrong place altogether. Clarendon, poor chap. He arrived on the 29th day of May and was given a front room on the third floor. Two days later, he asked to be moved to suite 205. To your knowledge, did he have any visitors? Only two that I'm aware of. One was a most disagreeable fellow. He was rather large, had a thick walrus moustache and a very prominent scar down his cheek. He arrived on the 1st of June. Well, the very day of Mr. Clarendon's move. He simply came in, sat down in the lobby and waited. Twenty minutes or so later, Mr. Clarendon came down from his room. The big man yanked him aside. I was about to send for a bobby when Mr. Clarendon signed me that all was well. After a few minutes, they left together. I never saw the man again. His other visitor, who came by quite frequently, was a most striking woman. She was quite fashionably dressed. She had a most distinctive laugh, very full and deep. I've no idea who she was. Please, tell us about the morning of July 2nd. It was about nine o'clock when a woman entered. She was rather plain looking and I wouldn't have noticed her, except for the fact that she came in the front door, looking neither left nor right, and proceeded directly up the staircase. It couldn't have been more than 30 seconds later when I heard a bang, followed by a woman's scream. I dashed upstairs to the second floor. The door to room 205 was open. Inside, I found the body of Mr. Clarendon and the woman who'd just come up. She was lying in a swoon in the center of the room with a pistol in her hand. I revived her with some whiskey. When she came to, she was totally disoriented. She had no idea where she was or what she'd done. When she saw Clarendon's body, she let out a shriek and dropped the pistol. I summoned the police. Tell me, at what hour are the hotel's front doors locked? Oh, ten o'clock, sir. Hmm. Anyone who arrives after that has to be let in by the night staff. Of course, Mr. Clarendon was never one of those. He was always in his room before ten. May we see his room? What are we here, Watson? It appears to be a bank statement. Well, look here, Holmes. It appears that the maid missed a spot in a sweeping. Good thing she did, Watson. You're staring at evidence. Hmm. Blood. What's this stain here? It smells like a fine sherry. Looks like someone's been celebrating. The question is, was it with the body or over it? Hmm. Nothing much here. A couple of shirts and uh, three pair of shoes. But what you fail to notice, my dear Watson, is that one of the pairs of shoes is canvas and has been dyed black. Interesting. A sweater and trousers. An ensemble in black. Not much of a view. All I can see is a brick wall of the building across the alley. Hmm. Ivy Vines binding up a trellis. I understand that Wilfred Robards is considering taking Miss Nolan's case. He might be able to help you. If you'd like, I can arrange an interview with Frances Nolan. She's being held downstairs, you know. We might be able to help you, Miss Nolan, if you could just remember what happened that night in Mr. Clarendon's room. Well, that's just the trouble. I can't remember anything except seeing Guy's body across the room and the pistol in my hand. Where did you get the pistol? I've no idea, though the police assure me it's mine. I didn't know Guy was at Halliday's. I've never even been there before. 
And why would I shoot him anyway? We loved each other. There, there, Miss Nolan. Stiff up a lip. Thank you. Miss Nolan, what is the last thing you remember before the room at Halliday's? Oh, hot cocoa in bed. I beg your pardon? Oh. Well, every night before I retire, my maid, Grace, brings me a cup of hot cocoa. How nice. Oh, yes. And before that? Well, before that, I dine with Dr. Trevelyan, as I do every Sunday evening. My sister, Loretta, is under his care. The doctor and I have become good friends over the years. He left at 10 o'clock, as he always does. May I ask, where did you first meet Guy Clarendon? Uh, at the country estate of Cornelius Oldwine, in March. My sister, Loretta, was attending a party there. I suppose things got a bit out of hand because it seemed she dived into a fountain. She caught pneumonia and I had to go and fetch her home. Guy was also at the estate, and that's where we met. And he immediately began paying court to you? Oh, heavens no. Nobody seems to take much notice of me. I suppose that comes from having such a wildly attractive sister. That's why I was so surprised when he called a few weeks later. We began seeing a great deal of each other. We went on long carriage rides, had picnic lunches. It was all quite lovely. And then on the 5th of June, he declared his love for me and asked for my hand in marriage. I was so happy. I couldn't have killed him. How do you explain your presence at Halliday's? Well, I can't. It's just like the other two times. You've had memory losses before. <laughs> yes, twice in the past month. The first time I found myself atop a horse in Hyde Park with no recollection of how I got there. The last thing I remember was having lunch with my sister, Loretta. Then there I was, atop a chestnut mare. How peculiar. The funny thing is, I'm terrified of horses. You mentioned there was a second time. Yes, a few days later, I met with my solicitor, Hiram Davenport. Then the next thing I know, I'm at the Newgate Street Station. I consulted my physician, Dr. Mason, and he was quite as baffled as I was. One last question, if you will. What is your relationship with Gerald Locke? Oh, Jerry, he's a dear old friend. Though I'm afraid we had a falling out of late. He said some very unkind words about Guy. Sure, I remember Clarendon. He and his lady friend used to stop in here from time to time. Usually on their way to Kilgore's gaming parlor or coming back from it. Rumor has it, Clarendon was into Kilgore for a sizable sum. Do you happen to know how much? Seven thousand pounds was the figure I heard. Got to the point Kilgore wouldn't allow him in the door. Clarendon made a big fuss till Gus Bullock stepped in. Clarendon backed down pretty quick. Don't blame him none. Nobody in their right mind would want to mess with the likes of Gus. Do you think Bullock was involved in the murder? Nothing you could tell me about that bloke would surprise me. Anyways, Kilgore makes it clear to Clarendon that he wants his money. Then, a month or so later, Clarendon comes in all smiles. And he and Kilgore getting on like chums. Figure Clarendon must have paid him back. Then, Calvin Leach steps into the picture. Now, who's Calvin Leach? Leach deals in what you might call stolen property. Square dealer, too. Give you one half the value of the article. What does Leach have to do with Clarendon and Kilgore? Usually nothing at all. But there it is. Leach... Kilgore and Clarendon meeting late at night just as thick as thieves. The meetings continued on right up to, well, the night before Clarendon's death. 
Very interesting. Now, we've been standing here jawing, and I don't recall hearing anybody order nothing. What'll it be, mate? Doctor, we understand that you dined with Francis Nolan on the evening of July 1st. Yes, that is correct. We dine every Sunday. Her sister Loretta has been under my care for some ten years. First at the Mesmer Braid Institute and then in private practice. Without breaching physician-patient protocol, would you mind telling us the nature of her illness? She never quite recovered from the overwhelming trauma of watching her parents being blown to bits. I quite understand. As is often the case with young orphans, they tend to create fantasies about their parents. Miss Loretta Nolan truly believes that her father was the King of England, making her a princess. Do you think her unconventional behavior stems from that fantasy? Absolutely. As a princess, she believes she can do no wrong. I must say that she's worlds apart from her sister Frances. Do you know Frances Nolan well? Yes, rather. Through my treatment of her sister, I've known her for years. Let me say that it is difficult to believe that Miss Frances is capable of murder. She has a quiet, unassuming personality. An act of such direct confrontation would not be at all in keeping with her character. Were Loretta and Frances close? I know without a doubt that Miss Frances loves and cares for her sister, almost as a parent would a child. Miss Loretta, well, she loves her sister as much as she is capable of love. I'm sorry, gentlemen, but it seems you will have to turn up a clue or two more before I'll judge this case. This is a difficult thing for a man to say about his only son. But Guy was a wastrel and a ne'er-do-well. Only a short month or so ago, I gave him 5,000 pounds and told him that was the last he'd see of my money. I'd hoped the shock would bring the boy around, make him realize he had to settle down instead of wasting his life on gambling and gallivanting around with that wild woman. Which wild woman was that? Loretta Nolan, of course. You mentioned gambling, Sir Francis. Have you any idea with whom he gambled or who might have wanted to kill him? I wish I did. He told us nothing. He only came around when he needed money. And when I told him there'd be no more, we never saw him. Just about broke his mother's heart. <laughs> there, there, Gertie. We still have one another. I've something you ought to know about Master Guy. One morning, rather early, about four or five weeks ago, I heard a terrible clatter downstairs, so I came down to investigate. It was Master Guy just coming home. He was in a terrible state, 
all battered and bruised with a fresh cut on his forehead. I asked him who did it to him and he wouldn't say. I think he was afraid for his life. court now stands in order. Mr. Holmes, I understand you've been looking into the murder of Guy Clarendon. That is correct, my lord. Would you be so kind as to tell the court who killed Mr. Clarendon? Certainly, my lord. I see. And what was Loretta Nolan's motive for killing Mr. Clarendon? Ah, greed. Pure and simple. Now, have you determined why Francis Nolan went to Halliday's? I have, my lord. Please inform the court. Not a sisterly thing to do at all. Is there anything else you wish to report to the court? Yes, my lord. I believe we've also solved the case of the society burglar. You don't say. Who is the guilty party? Guy Clarendon was straight from the upper crust. Why ever would he turn to a life of crime? Well done. I applaud your deductive skills. You will make a fine detective for Scotland Yard one day. However, you will have to do much better if you wish to match the sleuthing expertise of Mr. Holmes. That is extraordinary sleuthing. Why, I do believe you may have matched Mr. Sherlock Holmes' solution. A remarkable feat indeed. Excellent job on a most difficult case. If we had been doing our best, we could have solved this one in less points. But we're not too far off, are we? Well, Watson, we should be very pleased with ourselves on this one. Yes, indeed, Holmes. Two cases solved for Scotland Yard. Though I doubt that Lestrade will consider himself in our debt. Two? Yes, indeed. First, the society burglar. Clarendon was £7,000 in debt to the gambler Kilgore. Unfortunately, he was in his father's bad graces and he was flat broke. Do you suppose Kilgore sent Bullock around to rough Clarendon up? Good deduction, Watson. You're learning. That's why he moved into Halliday's, to escape Gus Bullock. And to pay off his debts, he took to burglary. Right you are. He acquired a black sweater, trousers, and a pair of black canvas shoes so as not to be seen or heard in the dead of night. He chose victims of his own class whose social comings and goings he knew well and whose homes he'd visited often. I still don't understand why, after he'd settled in at Halliday's, he changed rooms. Elementary, my dear Watson. To be at the back of the hotel with a vine-covered trellis conveniently leading in and out of his bedroom window. Quite so. Positively clever of you. May I continue? Oh, please do. On the 1st of June, Bullock tracked Clarendon down and confronted him in the lobby. Clarendon paid him the £5,000 that was given to him by his father. But he still owed Kilgore £2,000. And that was the same evening the society burglar struck for the first time. So pleased you've been paying attention, Watson. Soon after that, Clarendon, Kilgore and Calvin Leach, a known trafficker in stolen goods, were seen together. Notice, if you will, that... One half the value of the first three society burglaries is equal to £2,000. Half the value being the price normally paid by Calvin Leach for stolen goods. Notice also that this same amount is equal to the balance of Clarendon's debt to Kilgore. Fascinating. So with his new vocation, Clarendon now had an easy source of income. Quite so, as his succeeding bank transactions evidence. On the day after each of the next three burglaries, Clarendon made deposits. 
Everything went along swimmingly, and by June 30th, his debt was paid. But the tiara was stolen July 1st. Yes, Watson. Apparently, young Clarendon thought he'd found himself a new vocation. He might have lasted longer at it if he'd chosen something else to steal. Whatever do you mean, Holmes? Loretta Nolan's delusion that she was born of royal parentage proved to be his undoing. If she took it, how did she manage? No one saw her enter or leave. She came and went the same way Clarendon did. Via the trellis. She was armed with a derringer purchased at Escorts in her sister's day. Clarendon returned from his night's work and poured two glasses of wine in celebration. That's when Loretta Nolan shot him and took the tiara. How wicked of her. Not nearly as wicked as what she did next. What? She went to her sister Frances's home and hypnotized her. She then proceeded to instruct her to go to Clarendon's room with the derringer and fire it into the ceiling. Incriminate her own sister? But why? Ah, if we could determine that precisely, we could start our own institute. Sick mind, no doubt. But tell me, Holmes, how did Clarendon know the precise locations of each of his victim's jewels? Excellent question, Watson. Although there is no clear-cut evidence for this, I can only assume that Loretta Nolan must have been in on it, too. The only way Clarendon could have known the locations of the jewels was if the victims themselves had told him where to look. None of them recalls having told anyone, but in fact they did tell someone. Who? Loretta Nolan. She managed to hypnotize each of the ladies whose jewels were stolen and got them to reveal the precise locations of the family treasures. And left them with no memory of having done so. Precisely. Astounding, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. 